So thank you for having me. And I just want to say some comments before we really get going into the uh, message this morning. And I want to encourage you in the direction you're going is that keep it about relationships. I mean, my, the rule that I tell my staff and around the world we talk about all the time, I preach it all the time. There's three rules to kingdom living and what God is establishing in his words. All right, so write this down, put it in your head. It's, it's really difficult. It's the first one's relationships. The second is relationships. And the third is relationships. Relationships with God and each other. That's the church. That was tough, huh? Do you remember? But it, it, when we keep it that, remember, we have one law. The law of love. So, and I feel like God, I sense God doing that in here. And so truly, I think the timing's right. That God wants to expand that love in your heart because we have a small window left to be that witness and that light to this world and what we're talking about, what God's doing and, and calling in these days. So I wanted to just kind of make that comment as I thought about that. How many of you um, pretty new to Spirit of Martyrdom, right? I mean, pretty much the whole congregation. Now, again, I had, had 10 years with Voice of the Martyrs, so I think you guys are pretty familiar with Voice of the Martyrs. Have a debt of love to that organization, wonderful friends, again, some of them here. And, um, and, and the Lord in his orchestration launched me into this ministry with ultimately a blessing of Voice of the Martyrs in 2008. And the Lord continues to refine us, but made it a global ministry, little to my knowledge, and I just feel like a little person in the kingdom. And, we're st and, and what we've been able to define at this point in this interesting journey of life is best way to put that God's called us to is serving international and internationally leaders who risk much for Jesus. Who is that? That's actually you. Because ultimately when we come in Christ, we become a leader. We become salt and light. We become the permeating force of hope and love and the fruit of the Holy Spirit in this life. And in sin, remember, what, is, what, what does sin mean? It means slave to corruption, basically, right? So slave has no choice. So obviously that's a powerless person. But when then righteousness comes and we're changing, our lives are exchanged, the corruption, the sin, the brokenness, the wickedness, the hurt, the pain, the shame, and on and on. And we exchange it for Christ's righteousness. And supernaturally, the Spirit of Christ lives in us, and we're a new creation. Guess what? We're leaders. And as we mature in Christ, we take more and more risk for Him. Because this side of heaven is where the risk-taking happens. And in heaven, there's a lot less risk. So for you venture people, you better go for it. Because this is where it's happening. And God loves risk takers because that's faith, stepping out. And around the world in all these restricted, persecuted areas of the world, um, that is every day is a risk for Jesus to be identified, to live that life, and even more to be that witness. And that's why God has called us together today to be strengthened by their witness so that what? What is inputted in about us goes back to them. And we get to serve each other because we're in this family together. So there's two things that as I prayed this morning, as we prepared for this time, and then we're going to have the wonderful question and answer time and whatever God puts on your heart, I hope to really serve you this morning. But I want to pause for this moment to really pray and ask the Lord, one is that you would hear from God. I've asked this morning that every one of you are going to hear from God. All right. Second of all, is that you will get God's heart for multiplication and the witness to the world, that global spirit. So I want to pause right now and just ask the Lord to have his way and that all of you in that precious place in your heart would just say, God, open up my eyes and ears and whatever you want to hear. I, I had a lot of stories, a lot of scripture this morning. I don't know what's going to speak to you, but I know God wants to speak to you. And I just want to say he has this time. It's his mind, his spirit through me to you. And so let's just give him that lordship right now and let's pause to pray, have a moment of silence, and then we'll continue to launch in here. Jesus. Father, this morning, truly you have drawn us together. We are the demonstration of your grace and your love and that you're alive and that you want to redeem the world, and that you've connected us to a supernatural family. So, Father, I ask 
right now, every person here in their own place, their own way, how you speak every language of every heart, whether that be in a, just a prompting, whether that be a, a vision, whether that be a dream, whether that be uh, just words. I don't even care if it's audible, Father. You have spoken through the histories to your people. And Lord, you want your people to hear you so that we can obey and be in that relationship and intimacy with you, Father. So I just ask that you would come and visit us and then anoint every head here right now, God, with your Holy Spirit so that together we might hear your voice grow in the priesthood of believers so that together we could serve and encourage one another all the more as we see that day approaching. And we know as we hear you, Father, that your heart and passion for these days is to fill the earth with your glory as the oceans fill, uh, the, the waters fill the oceans, God, in the earth. And so we just pray right now, Lord, that we would get understanding and vision for our part in this global end time work. In Jesus' name, amen. And so a lot of people are captured and sometimes a little surprised by our name, spirit of martyrdom. The word martyr means witness in the gospel. It comes from the Greek word martus, used 34 times in the New Testament. So that's our theme text. You shall be my witnesses, my martuses. Jerusalem, Judea, uh, uh, Jerusalem, Judea uh, Samaria, and the remotest parts of the earth. And so our past is serving the church of the living martyrs because everyone who receives the spirit of Christ, that's the spirit of martyrdom. And, and, and why do we pick that word, do you see? Because the reason that word is used as witness, most often translated, is because it's the, it's the credible witness so much as so someone would rather die then corrupt the truth. And so in history, that's why we honor the martyrs of Christ who return love and truth and proclaim Christ unto death. And that's why Fox's Book of Martyrs was the, in 1600s, was the number one book. And then um, John, John uh, Bunyan's was next. Pilgrim's Progress. And so we hope to be one of those ministries to return honor where honor should be and to incite the body of Christ this morning to courage, love, faith, and boldness in proclamation and standing together with our global family. And, then, and certainly that's the mark that Christ did in my heart and life. I'm here because the Lord spoke to me. I remember my first time when I was five years old, my brother came home and asked me if I had ever received Jesus personally. I lived in a godly home. My, parent, my dad's a pastor. My mom loves the Lord. Uh, so I had a sense of God's presence, but I had never responded personally to God's invitation. So that was the beginning of me hearing because immediately in my heart, I was convicted like at a five-year-old <laughs> level, but it was real because it's the only thing I remember. And I said a little prayer of salvation at five years old. And here I am today. It was significant. I remember in high school, I was in evangelism and class and sharing, learning to share my faith and going out with these teams and um, and, and got, I was zealous for the Lord. And I came home one night, and, and it, truly today, I recognized what a demonic attack it was. And I, ha, I felt like this attack of all this work, that something was speaking to me. And uh, it was saying, this isn't true. How do you know this is true? And I began to quote Bible verses. And then the, 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 the voice would say, that, how do you know that's true? It's all based upon lies. It's not true. And I was I was drown I literally felt like I was drowning in doubt, desperation, scary. And all of a sudden, I never memorized this verse. All of a sudden, the word of God spoke to me, ye of little faith, why do you doubt? And I saw this picture in my mind of a hand coming from heaven. I was in this ocean and it picked me up and I thought, what the heck am I doing? That's right. God's in control here. And ever since that time, it was so profound that I've never been attacked you know, by doubt because Satan has to change up his tactics, right, when he loses a battle. And so what I've learned, and again, uh, think about that Paul talks about we are to pray without ceasing. That's not a religious expression because obviously that would be useless and we wouldn't be good witnesses at that point. 
Praying without ceasing is the beauty. Prayer is the communication that we have spiritually to an almighty God, the creator of the universe. And when we're praying without ceasing, even right now in our hearts, and I know in your hearts, there's an open channel. And yes, there's times of concerted prayer, prayer, fasting, bowing down, prostration, all that. That's perfectly good. But you see, concert, but prayer, the prayers of, of, that are effective are the prayer, and even let's talk about Isaiah, if you look at it, and the prayer and the prayer and fasting that cast out demons. It's a, it's a type of relationship with God so that you're in communion so much that when you come across that, de that demonic forces, you are immediately hearing from God knowing how to deal with it. That's the prayer that Jesus was talking about. This demon needs to come out with prayer and fasting. It's not this idea, okay, we got to have 30 days of prayer and fasting for this demon's going to pay attention. No, because we have the authority of Christ in us. So it's a, it's a maturity situation that we are walking that kind of maturity. So the issue and the essence of, of, of that relationship and hearing from God becomes profound for the disciple. And that really today, when I'm with believers, I, um, many times, I don't really care and when I'm at, talking to them what they're reading in the Bible. When people, believers tell me what you're reading in the Bible, I don't really care about that because I usually turn and say, okay, that's great, but I want to tell me, what are you hearing in the Word of God? What are you hearing from God? Because there's a lot of people, I think all of us know, that know a lot of Bible verses and their lives are a wreck. Because hear and obey. And so I want us to think about that this morning as we dive into it, is really what is the greatest commandment? Right? And probably most of you go, yeah, well, that's simple. Right? Love God, love others. Right? And yet, is it? And the only reason we could know, and right, the only authority they were on is, and test me and everything, right, as Bereans, Let's go to the Word of God. Mark 12 is addressed here, and I have it up for you if you want, and you could just enjoy it. If you want to just, I'll give it to you here. It's just a picture of this situation. A scribe listening to Jesus be tested, answering questions, and he was impressed. He was pricked that, man, Jesus had authority. So, so we pick up the story, and one of the scribes came up to, and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that Jesus, let me re replace the pronouns with proper nouns, names so you can follow the story well. So that Jesus answered them well. Ask Jesus, which commandment is the most important of all? So there it is. I just ask you, this is uh, asked by the scribe. Jesus gets the answer. So let's pay really careful attention how Jesus answers this, all right? Jesus answered, the most important is... Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one, and you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, there it is. It's pretty good. But let's continue to think about the interplay here because there's something that really happens here. It's interesting. There is no other commandment greater than this. And the scribe got excited, so let, catch this. It said, to him, oh, you are right, teacher. Uh, you have uh, truly said that, uh, that he, God is one, and there is no others beside him, right? And you should love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love one's uh, neighbor as yourself is much more than all whole burnt uh, offerings and sacrifices, and Jesus saw that he answered wisely. And that, that's a nice compliment. What Jesus thinks we answered wisely. I like that. So you see, something's happening in that scribe. We know spiritually something's happening. And he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now that's profound. Because if you think about the word of God, think about how often Jesus answered quite a little different ways. Lazarus, right? Up in the tree, you know, um, I, I, and he said, he said to Lazarus, you are a son of Abraham, right? He said to the bent over woman, she's a daughter of Abraham. He said to the centurion, you shall sit at the seat of the Abraham, Isaac, of Jacob. But to the scribe, he didn't say, 
you will, uh, you're in the kingdom of God. He said, you're not far from the kingdom of God. He missed something. What did he miss? So, if we break this down, let's think about carefully what was just the interplay right there. Because we know he missed something. He, but did, what did he hit, right? Did you catch what the scribe said? He did say, love God, love others, right? But let's think about what Jesus said. Now, Jesus said, remember, he goes, and the most important is this. What's the first words out of Jesus' mouth? Here. So according to Jesus, in order, the most important commandment is to listen. But then, and then Jesus went on to say something else. Hear, O Israel, God's people, the Lord our God is one. So we have to identify who we're hearing. And then finally now, love God, love others. So Jesus names four things. Listen, one God, love God, love others. But what did the Pharisee, uh, or the scribe come back with? One God, love God, love others. What did he miss? He missed here. You see, the disciples hear and they obey. That's the new life of Christ. That's the relationship. That's the beauty because we become the images of God himself. Even Jesus himself says, I only say what I've heard from my father. We are a, to be a channel of his grace, his truth, his abundance, his majesty, his wisdom. And so that when people meet us, they truly go away and go, surely I've been with Scott. No, surely I've been with Jesus because Scott is saying something that's beyond Scott. And you see, that's the key. Because faith comes by hearing. Wait, did you hear? It's not reading. It's not studying. Think about all the other words that could be used. It's hearing and hearing the word of Christ. 40% of the world is unreached and restricted to the gospel. They have never heard They've never heard, not read, heard. And yes, way, one way of hearing is to read. But God's passionate about that. And the, the sobering reality, and part of the reason I'm here this morning, is 3%, according to Joshua Project, 3% of American resources, of all the funds that go through the uh, Christian organizations in America, goes to 40% of the most unreached and persecuted. I would love to see that change. <laughs> And that's why we're an organization of the three percenters. But we're inviting you to be part of the three percenters. In our kingdom portfolio of time, effort, giving, that we are passionate about the 40%. Because 40% of the world today couldn't go to Walmart and get a Bible, convenience store. They couldn't tune in to a Christian teaching. They don't know the language. You can go on and on the problems, the barriers there. It's illegal. They're being watched. And so God's passionate to speak his word. And he's going after believers today, supernaturally. But he's always connected to the church one way or another down the road. But I could tell you God's a God that even at times will supernaturally intervene to draw someone in and to reel them in. Uh, this last year, I had, had an interview with uh, Manny uh, from uh, West Africa. And uh, Manny was part of the Fulani tribe, raised... Um, from a very devout Islamic family and um, even a tradition of, from his uh, mom's side of imams. And he uh, was put in a Christian school at first. And then other friends of the father said, oh, if you put in a Christian school, he's going to become a Christian. And so as soon as the father was able, he put him in a Quranic school. He began to learn the Quran and went through the completion of uh, many years in Quranic school and memorizing the Quran and knowing that, and, and he uh, hated Christians. He didn't ever want to go to the West, had no desire. And then ultimately in his life, he uh, went to um, Libya and worked in Libya. But in, uh, the, uh, the Quran says that all Muslims are equal. But that's not what he experienced because when he went to the mosque, the Arabs in North Africa would hold their nose and say, you stink, because they said in the Muhammad said that all blacks dark-skinned people stink. And, uh, and, the, and then the Quran says that you're, when you're in a row, because show unity 
of the Muslim community. You're supposed to touch feet together and it'd be a perfect row. And none of the Arabs wanted to touch his feet. And the Arabs would say, why do you even come here? Because um, you're black, which uh, the Islam teaches you're already cursed and going to hell. You have no uh, choice in that. And so he was so poorly treated and disillusioned that he decided um, that maybe the Westerners had something to offer. So he decided to go to Europe. And he went to um, Europe and um, he uh, began to get involved. He began to smoke and drink. He began to do drugs. He became a drug dealer, going to prison a couple times. But right when he started that, he, uh, he, he began to hear a voice. And the voice uh, first told him that if you keep on doing this, he said, uh, you're going to die. And this isn't good to you. Stop doing this. And, and he told his friends this, and they said, for instance, so it's just the drugs you're hearing. And he knew there's some voice was tied to him. And then um, one time he got uh, sick, and he had this pain for two weeks. He was in so much agony and pain, and he didn't know what to do. And, he, um, and, and the night before, a, a man in white came to him and said, you are sick. Tell the doctor the next morning all the, what's going on. And then the, and the man showed him where the pain was and explained what the problem is. He said, tell this to the doctor. And he went in, and the um, next day when he went to the doctor, he told the doctor um, what had happened. And so the doctor closed the door, closed the windows, uh, locked all the windows. He sat down, he said, with a cop, he said, now tell me the details of this. And so he told him, and he said the doctor got up and he took this book and he raised his hands. And he didn't know what it was. He's now later realizes the doctor was a Christian and he was praying. And he said, right when he did the surgery, and it was a surgery that he was awake, he immediately cried, I am healed, and felt a healing uh, take place. And so then he desired to go to America. And then he heard, but as he was contemplating this, a voice came to him and said, if you go to America, you will become rich, but you ultimately die and forfeit everything. Is it worth to become rich and die? If you go back to your home country, you will find me and you will have life. And he thought, he was in such confusion, he said, why go back to, you know, Northwest Africa, which is difficult and hard, and he was confused in his heart. But he was convinced, and the, and the voice again spoke to him and said, what do you choose? Are you going to choose to go to America, or are you going to choose to seek me? And he said, I will go back to my home country. So he went back to his home country, Guinea, Conakry, and uh, which is mostly uh, Islam, M Muslim, and, and he was still doing drugs, but he still had this voice. Every time he did drugs, this voice would say, stop doing that. It's not why you came back to this country. And then this old man came to him, and the old man, um, was a, he later found out was a secret Christian, a Muslim secret Christian. And the old man said, you know, I'm having a problem with the Quran, this French Quran, because it talks about, it has this weird thing. And you know how the French can corrupt things? <laughs> the infidels, right? So I was wondering if you could read this in the Quran. So he, he read it and how it talks about that. Because again, if you guys don't know from the Quran, the Quran talks about Jesus 600 years after Jesus. And, um, it, and it only makes Jesus a prophet, not the son of God. That's a whole different discussion. But, but interesting enough, there's a witness of Christ in the, the Quran. It, it ultimately doesn't go far enough, but... But it says in this part of the Quran, which I've even talked with Muslims about, where it talks about that Jesus was the son of Mary, the word of God, word of Allah in the Quran, of course, uh, the, the Messiah, and that from him, he would bring judgment. And he was shocked because he had read that verse, he memorized the Quran studies, but it was the first time he had revelation thinking, wait a minute. This tells me that Jesus is the Messiah and he is bringing judgment. He said he broke out in a cold sweat, realizing that, no, this is, this, because his chronic teacher used to tell him that was only during the Christian times when Jesus was alive, but it's no longer true today. But clearly the Quran was telling him that Jesus was the one who brought judgment. So he was still the ruler and the king today. And he, and he says, this is a real Quran. <laughs> he was just shocked. And so he said, can I borrow this? So he borrowed his French Quran and so that other, you know, <clears throat> Other Muslims could um, see that. And then he, he explained to the old man how Jesus, how this, he had heard this voice all this time. And the old man rejoiced. He said, yes, 
Jesus could speak to you in dreams, in visions. He can even speak audibly to you. That's Jesus. And so when he heard that, that's when faith filled his heart. And he began to tell other people about Jesus. And 25 of his friends um, came to Christ. And so one, one of his great desires then was to be a church planner. And he, um, by God's grace, was able to go to our church planning school that we just started in Northwest Africa and Senegal area. And now he's planting churches. And he's spreading the word, sharing the word of God so others hear the voice of Jesus and respond. So you see, Jesus still speaks today and he wants his children to respond. Because you see, hearing, if we look at the scriptures, is the equivalent, and it's equivalent, give ear, listen, is used over 1,600 times in the word. You know how many times the word study is used? In the King James, it's three times. You know how many times the word and the equivalence of read is 60 times. 1,600 times. The Lord wants his children to hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. Hear, church. O church. You replace that. And so you see the disciples of Christ around the world are the ones who hear and obey. Russell Stendell is our director and does all the work for us in Latin America, Colombia specifically based. And he was taken by the guerrillas in um, the Civil War in Colombia 54 years long before it came to peace just a few years ago that he helped even negotiate with the FARC um, guerrilla commanders. He, he so much befriended them that they lifted him up. And he was uh, five months uh, held in the jungle, tied around a tree, thinking he would be shot any time. And, um, and, and so he had a kind of a grumpy attitude about that. <laughs> And so the Lord began to speak to his heart and remind him that God had spoken to him just the month before to start praying and interceding for the guerrillas. And he did that, praying and interceding, asking God to bring the gospel to the guerrillas so that the civil war could come to an end, you know, shut the window where the problem started. And he was really interceding and feeling like God was going to do something. And then all of a sudden now he's tied to a tree, not knowing if he'd see his wife again, his child again. He could be killed any time. And the Lord had to start reminding him. He said, remember, you prayed. I told you to start interceding. You prayed and, dis and agreed with me. And so now I've sent you, uh, the word of God through you to the gorillas. <laughs> and so he began to see the God's picture. He asked for a typewriter. They gave to him. And so he literally typed out that book while he was in the, the jungles. And, and Russell's told me before, he says he was actually introvert, quiet, hardly would say a word for um, many years before the jungle. But when he came out of the jungle, he now had a message. And I can verify he hasn't stopped talking yet. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And so the Lord used him for all these years of one million Bibles distributed in Columbia and three uh, million Christian materials. And because of his perseverance, building friendship with his enemies, the guerrillas, who were the number one persecutors and martyrs makers of literal death in the 2000s, beginning in the 2000s, they were killing the most Christians in the world for a while. That's the kind of guys he made friends with. One Christmas, he was with the guerrillas in a guerrilla camp, and the guerrillas asked him, so what do you do for most Christmases? He says, I go around and find them some of the most broken, hurting, violent people I can and hang out with them. And they just all laughed. That's literally true. That's what his spirit was. Because he just built relationships and he proclaimed the word of God so that they can hear. Because how can they hear without someone preaching? And so God's just in, uh, incited him towards the word of God and the power of to change it. And so recently now with the, the disillusionment of and, the, and the, the massive problems in Venezuela, the blackouts, or the, the, the million percent inflation. Uh, people are literally, you know, hungry. Uh, the, the infrastructure is destroyed there because the, the government, uh, govern, uh, the um, president there, Maduro, he's stopped humanitarian, you know, aid coming in. So those borders were shut tight these last few months. But guess what? When we showed up with our Bibles and a lot of prayer and trusting God, and we went through, this is Venezuelan um, soldiers you're seeing here. And we went through uh, security uh, and, and had to get those Bibles in. 
At first, it was tense environment, and they opened up the box, and when they saw boxes, the whole disposition changed. And they said, and, and, and the officer in charge said, this is what Venezuela needs. He said, you can bring as many Bibles as you want. And so we're getting favor everywhere, bringing in the word of God. We ask him, how many Bibles do they need? They, he said, 30 million. <laughs> That's the population of Venezuela. I love the uh, get brother's uh, vision because they're destitute, they're broken, and even the Catholic Church has not brought, you know, hope and love. And in the history of the Catholic Church, there's not been, ever been a ref reformation in the Spanish-speaking world. They've been taught not to read the Bible. So finally now they're desperate for hope and peace and provision. And, uh, and so God put upon our heart to pray for 2 million Bibles. We feel 1 million changed Columbia. Being when R uh, Russell first moved there with his family, it was estimated under 1% would identify themselves as Christian, even joke Christian. Today it's 33%. And so the, the word of God changes people. You remember the word of God prepares the heart for revival. And when revival happens, people go to the word of God, right? So I think this is a good mainstay of focus, of distribution and impact. We don't know of any other Bible distribution in Venezuela for 20 years. We've discovered now that there's some fellowships that don't have any or just one Bible in Venezuela. It's a Bible drought shortage. What can the word of God do? Powerful, but it's not just paper and pen though, you see, because this is meaningless unless it jumps out paper pit and they hear the word of God. It's proclaimed and received and then brings transformation. And that's God's people. That's the church doing the work. This woman uh, we just recently gave a bio to, she said to us, she said um, so, someone was going, um, she dreamed the night before that someone was going to bring them Bibles and the next day the Bibles arrived. They had not seen any Bibles for over 20 years. Look at her brokenness in the lady. Praise the Lord. More valuable than life. There's people traveling many miles would give everything they have to get the word of God today. Praise God. When there's a drought, that only gives a greater desire for the truth. So God's the drought maker too. He will bring us through difficult, hard times like in Israel to where they even thirst. Because you brought that up this morning. Because you see, here's the problem. If we don't get to a place of thirst, we can't drink from that water. So God is a God who disciplines those whom he loves. And if you even, some of you are in that season right now, you know what? This morning, I hope I'm a reminder that you're connected around the world with other brothers and sisters going through very difficult times. And you know why? Because God loves you. And, then when you, and, and, and when you get through it, and ultimately in heaven, you're going to be really glad God did that because he refined you perfectly to what he desired. And uh, so again, join us in praying for 2 million Bibles. It's going to be a miracle. But thus far in 11 years of spirit of martyrdom, everything we've done is basically miraculous. We are live hand to mouth. We don't build up a reserve. We don't have a savings account. We just simply, as God gives the resources, we try to get it where God is working. And then Russell just recently visited the border region on that river there, you see, and proclaiming the word of God so that they can hear and have faith and receive and be transformed. Isn't that powerful? Because much of the world is illiterate on top of it. They don't have the written word. But that, it doesn't take necessarily the written word to be saved. It takes faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And um, Santiago is one of those that were transformed of, of literally thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, who have been touched by the Lord. He was a commander of the guerrillas, and I got to interview him a few years ago, and he, um, he grew up in a very dysfunctional family full of violence and alcoholism and, and tension, and so he joined the guerrillas at age 14. It's a lifetime commitment. If you ever leave the guerrillas during those times, you would be put to death. He was a natural leader, very violent, and was raised up in the um, leadership to finally became a commandante over a whole uh, front of, uh, he said, 290 men. And, um, and, so, and one of the things is he hated Christians because his agenda and Marxist is atheism. So he shut down eight churches in a region and made sure there was no churches in his region that he was oversight over. He began to notice all those churches they shut down, the morality got worse and worse the theft, 
the drugs. And so he changed his mind and he began to help the Christians as he could. And, uh, and then he said he got into a, a major uh, a gun battle with, all, with the army, the Colombian army, and his personal bodyguards were killed. And many of his men were killed, and he got separated from his men, and the Colombian army was closing in on him, and they wanted him. And, and, and it started to rain and lightning, and he, and he was on a ridge, and they were just 300 feet from him, the Colombian army, and he found on this ridge this cave, and he covered the cave with some sticks and bushes, what he could, and then it was lightning and thunder, and, and the lightning was going and exposing his hideout, and, he was, and then all of a sudden this atheist was getting, obviously, faith. He was crying out against God, why are you exposing my place? And so he just knew the, Col the Colombian government was going to find him, and he said he'd rather die than be a prisoner, so he put his gun to his, uh, his mouth. He was ready to pull the trigger, and the wind was blowing, but all of a sudden the wind, he clearly heard, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't kill yourself. Don't do it. And it, wouldn't, it was relentless. This voice kept going, don't do it. And, he, and all of a sudden, really, it, it was the voice of God speaking to him. And he responded. And, and, and he said, Lord, save me. And he said, at that moment, it was like a kiss and a hug from heaven. A presence came and filled him with joy and peace. He threw his gun to the back of the, uh, the cave and the wind settled, the lightning settled, and he fell asleep in a deep sleep. He woke up. He said, I was a new man. I didn't have a desire to fight anymore. I just, I just wanted to have a whole new life. And he said, all of a sudden, he saw someone move in the bushes and a hand came through and it was a farmer with a coffee. He said, what are you doing? You're going to expose me to the army because they're still scouting and looking for him. And the farmer said, don't worry, trust God, follow me. And so the Christians began to hide their enemy, the, the far gorilla commandante there, from the army, began to feed him. The pastor, who he almost killed, heard what had happened. He rode three hours on a horseback ride, came, gave him a Bible. And ultimately, then God spoke to him to turn himself in to the government. And he was afraid to death to do that. But the Holy Spirit led him to Isaiah 41.10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. Isn't that awesome? Uh, an atheist the day before, now I am your God. That God claims us so quick. Beautiful. A persecutor of Christians. Now a proclaimer. A believer. I will strengthen you I will help you and I will uphold you with my righteousness. And I love it. So, his, so ultimately it's a journey. And um, he turned himself in and then connected ultimately even with Russell Stendell on the radio. He began to now be on the radio and ex commandante and now proclaim God's word, preaching and teaching. He said this quote, he said, My life is now full of stories of God's grace and provision. Now I desire to do whatever he wants. Jesus said to go into all the world and preach the gospel. This is again Santiago. To every creature, I say to my Lord, here I am, send me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He is with his wife and his child. That's the transformation of the gospel when we hear him. And this morning, you see, I think God would want to, again, us to hear his voice. As John 10 says, to him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought them all to his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him. For they, right, the sheep, the disciples, the church, you, I pray. But even if it isn't you this morning, that's okay. Because God wants it to be you. I'm just here as a vessel, a fellow journeyer saying, the gospel's for you. Maybe you've known all about Jesus this morning. Maybe you, you know the word fairly well, but you've never heard Jesus. Let this be the day. This, Hebrews says today is the day of salvation. You do not harden your heart. So again, when he has brought them all out, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they do not fall, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of a stranger. 
So it's a good time to break right now. And, um, but let's just break with that thought. And I want to, first of all, have a moment to just listen to the Lord in, in, in spirit of quietness and then continue to constant meditate on that as we're going to have some more time together. We're going to have some fellowship. But I appreciate, again, your, all of your attentiveness. It's just fun to be here this morning. So let's pray. Father, I just thank you that your word is with us. That you've spoken to us. Father, you speak to us. General revelation, your creation speaks to us. The specific revelation, your word of God speaks to us. And the rhema word, which is the Holy Spirit, speaks to us. As in my life, I've literally met thousands who have told me the testimonies, visions, dreams, audible voice, an inaudible voice, just it, clarity in the mind, understand interpretation, understand uh, sovereignty with desire and passion. Lord, you speak to us and uniquely. And so I pray this morning, Father, again, as we've already asked, come Lord Jesus, speak to us. Here we are. Send me. So just receive for the Lord right now. And Father, may your voice continue to soothe us, speak to us all through this day, and even during this break. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.